Hello and welcome to episode two of our new podcast series, Unmasking Leaders, hosted by Katie Wilson and me, Izzy McCatty. This is a new series that features interviews with senior leaders delving beneath the surface of the stories most see to uncover deeper insights. The series aims to explore what leaders have learned in their darkest times and what is crucial for creating change or running a business effectively. By digging deeper, we hope to share knowledge and experiences that are non-technical as these insights can be invaluable for emerging generations as they begin their careers. So today we are delighted to be joined by Bob Cotton. Hi, Bob. Hi, Katie, and hi, Izzy. Thank you for joining us. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to start by asking you some questions that delve into your personal experiences, and then later we'll touch on your own perspectives of the current business landscape. So to kick off, um, undoubtedly reflecting on the difficult periods in our lives can often reveal important insights. And obviously you've had quite the um, extensive career. <laughs> so looking back, what lessons did you learn in your darkest moments? Well, I think what is interesting from the question is that if, you'd, if someone had asked me this question maybe 15 years ago, I would have answered it entirely differently to sort of now, it's as I'm sort of at an older age, you can look back with probably a more balanced perspective and a more balanced understanding of yourself, because that's what it is about at the end of the day, is that sort of when you're younger, certain things seem much more important. As you get older, you can actually see what were the important things in life, what were the real challenges to you, and why you did certain things. And you sort of sometimes need a bit of age and perspective to bring an answer to those questions. That's really interesting, actually, you say that. So would you say it's um, how many years would you say you've kind of felt you've had this better perspective on your career and the uh, darkest moments would you say awful to say but i think possibly you know in the last five seven years and i think and again um it, it it's a sort of a negative and a positive i think in many regards um covid and everything i saw around covid actually um helped me gain a, a sort of a better understanding and a better perspective of where things stood, as it were, personally and around your friends, family and business. Because it was such a, you know, it's almost like for my parents' generation, everything was sort of around a perspective of essentially the, the, the late 30s and what happened in the Second World War. And I know, being close to my parents, that affected the whole of the rest of their life in terms of the way they acted, the way they thought, what they did. And in many ways, to me, COVID was such a major change to anything I had known in, you know, quite frankly, 50 years of business that who would ever have expected, you know, the country being closed down, not once, but twice. And I mean closed down in that you know, streets deserted, no activity, business being laid off, etc., etc. You know, that was our equivalent of what I term wartime to to certainly people of my generation. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you've always had a very positive outlook on situations? Or do you feel you've always had to sort of like work on it to gain that resilience? <laughs> Fortunately, I, I've nearly always had a very positive view on on almost everything. And I, I, also, I always put that back down to the fact that I had a, a, a great upbringing, a very close relationship with my parents and brothers and sister. So I was sort of always felt very secure in that background and knowledge that, you know, if, if everything else went wrong, I always had the support of my, my, my close family. And I think... To be brought up in that positive environment gives you a very secure feeling that, come what may, you will find solutions to whatever problems you have. And it's having that, as it were, positive outlook that, yes, we all have difficulties, but you've got to then put the difficulties in perspective and make the difficulties an opportunity for you to say, well, yes, it's, this has happened. Now, how can I actually take it forward and make that difficulty a positive, whether it's a change of job, a change of environment, a change of location, you know, what are the positives that you can take out of 
something that's happened. So that, I think, is looking to the positive. But you only do that if you have a very secure feeling about yourself and your close personal family. That's really interesting. I think that's becoming also something that um, businesses are trying to think about how they can support people more as well in terms of making them feel like they can kind of reach for the stars, even though that's that cliche uh, well, saying that you can then not be afraid of failing because you've got the support system around you. Well, well, that's it, it's an interesting analogy because, you know, some people are very fortunate that they do come from a secure family background and have family around them. But, you know, more and more in the modern world, you know, the uh, you know, almost the majority of people now either come from broken homes or don't have that security of family, et cetera, to fall back on. So they actually need something else to make them feel secure. And, you know, those companies that actually can engender that in the workplace are the ones that are winning and are positive. I mean, you see, that's what the armed forces try and do. Uh, to, to make people feel part of a, a large family, as it were, and offer them support. And I think the best companies do provide that secure support feeling so that people feel secure, they're able to take risks, they know they're going to be supported, and that there are people there who care about um, their health, their mental health and their well-being. Yeah, that's 100%. And I, I feel like I know the answer to what you're, what this next question is going to ask you, but have you ever had any times where you felt like giving up? Um, I feel like it might be a no off what you've just said because you had the support. I think, I think there have been a couple of times when for a, I won't say a very short time, but I mean maybe for half a day after something happened, it took you to sort of um, go home that night and have a, have a quiet think and have a maybe a chat to your partner or or someone that's very close to you and put what happened in the day into perspective, if you understand. And then by the, uh, I've always been a very good sleeper, so I've always taken the view, go to bed, have eight hours sleep, and then the following morning I can see everything clearly. So that's always been my technique is the fact that I can go to bed and have a good night's sleep and see things more clearly the next morning. I think people underestimate that, actually, in terms of how much those things that can help support your body and refresh your mind. And then you have that logical way of looking at a, at a situation that might have happened. So I feel I, I completely agree that I've always been a good sleeper. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> no, I have to well. say uh, that's, that's come home to me very recently i've always been a very good sleeper and it's always been one of my it's helped make me resilient but just three or four years ago i had sort of a lot of pain in my my leg and my hip and they eventually diagnosed that it was i needed a hip replacement and for about a year it really was causing extreme pain so that i really wasn't sleeping very well etc etc um a year or so ago, I got the hip fixed, all done, totally successful, and I'm back to sleeping eight, nine hours every night. And I can tell you, you feel like a new world again. That ability to have a good sleep should never be underestimated in terms of what it does to your, your mental health, never mind your physical health. And I really do feel for those who for whatever reason, are unable to get what I term a good night's sleep. Sounds pretty simple, I know, but I can tell you um, it is absolutely critical. Definitely. I think it's a lot harder than, than it may seem. Um, what would you say has been the inspiration behind your career? Uh, in a very simplistic way, I think it's what I term personal pride in that I, you know, my, my, you know, I, very close to my family, brothers, sister, and parents, and it was really sort of personal pride in wanting to do your best for them. So you were brought up with a strong work ethic. So it was always really about personal pride. And I've always taken the view, if you go to work every day and you do the best you can at work, that's all that can be expected of you. And if you can look in the mirror every night and say, I did the best I could today, that's what drives you forward. 
uh, it's not about necessarily being right or wrong. It's doing the best you can and feeling in your conscience that you've given it your best shot. And it was personal pride always that uh, uh, pushed me on, shall we say. You know, because I did start off 1967, seems a long time ago now. You know, I was a commie chef in a canteen in the Ford Motor Company. You know, so um, it, you, you can't say you've had what I term a silver spoon. You, you've gone through almost every stage from that. And it was pride in what you were doing and the driver to sort of keep moving forward. I think also when you say that as well, I think um, the pride moving forward is obviously so important, but that doesn't necessarily, I think people forget that that can also mean that some days you might not get things right or you might not, as people say, fail uh, or do something wrong. And it's learning from those mistakes, but that's still driving forward, isn't it? It's recognizing. Well, exactly. That it's recognizing that, you know, you did make a mistake or you could have done it better, but you felt at the time it was the right thing and you did your best. So you, you didn't do something wrong deliberately but it's learning from the mistake. And I often say to lots of people when they ask for careers advice or whatever is that, you know, always do the best you can. But, you know, quite often people are given little bits of good fortune in their life. And if you're, you know, if you're lucky enough to be given a little bit of good fortune, job opportunity or a career promotion or whatever, the trick is to recognize that you've been given that little bit of good fortune and make the most of it. I think so many people, when they look back on their lives, will think, yes, I could have done this or I could have done that, i.e. They've, they've had opportunities and not taken the opportunity. And sometimes you've got to recognize when you're given an opportunity, take the risk and go for it. Yeah, I think that makes me think about the Gardner Merchant days where all I've read is how um, no one was afraid of failing and it was a very kind of supported uh, environment for people to feel brave. Um, it, well, it, and it was, and that's because, I mean, I can tell you that, you know, of a company of, you know, 50,000 people and the and I would say, you know, management were about sort of three to 5,000 of that 50,000 people. The turnover was sort of 5% or less, i.e. one very low turnover of, of your management cadre because people enjoyed working there, but they felt secure as well. And there were great you know, promotional opportunities. We had this um, culture of prom promotion from within so that you could start off as assistant manager, then become a manager, then district manager, then sales consultant, regional manager, regional director, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there are so many opportunities, not just for frontline operators, but also for the specialists, whether it's sales, HR, corporate affairs, as I ended up doing, whatever, you know, finding career opportunities for the right people and the fact that you don't actually have to leave the company to progress your career. You know, that, that, was, that was really the driver of the success of Gardner Merchant from when I was fortunate enough to join in the late 70s right through to, you know, leaving in, what, 1998 to go to DCMS. You know, long period. And the reason I didn't look to leave was because I was happy in what I was doing. And I think that's always key, isn't it, where people feel valued or like there's a space for personal growth as well in terms of careers, in terms of just improving as yourself as well. I think that can be really undervalued. Um, well, well, it, well it, it's, you know, in the main, if you are happy in what you do and you have a good relationship with your immediate boss, you don't look to leave. I've always said people leave people, not companies. You know, if you're badly managed or badly treated by your immediately superior, your immediate superior, you look to leave and you might give lots of excuses like I can earn more money or this, that and the other. But the real reason you're leaving is you're not being properly managed by your immediate supervisor. So I've always taken the view that a lot of people leave people, not companies. And that is why it's therefore so important to have that positive relationship with the people around you and the people you're responsible for. And would you say, looking back over your career, I'm sure you went through some really stressful situations in work. Did you have 
uh, certain strategies to to cope or was it as simple as just making sure you got your sleep and reflecting later on and well having... I, I, I remember a couple of extreme situations one is I, I remember I can I can uh, talk about this now that when I was sort of coming up through the, the you know as it were the, the ladder of jobs I remember moving from one particular company to another company and I moved to the other company because I I knew the person who recruited me exceptionally well from the past and I had a high regard for them and that is why I moved to work directly for them and within one month of being there that person was promoted within the company uh, away and he was replaced by someone I could barely speak to we just didn't get on so it was a matter of three months before you know we really fell out and I had to be moved somewhere and fortunately I was with Gardner Merchant they found a place to move me and would you believe it was Northern Ireland I mean that was far enough away from everyone and you know that was that took a little bit of what I term reflection as it were getting over that and then I had a second opportunity which was very stressful when actually we were doing the the MBO uh, from Trust House Forte, and then subsequently the sale to Sodexo, and that took about two years. And I was actually um, sacked twice during that procedure, but my immediate boss, Gary Hawkes, was immediately, was very supportive of me personally. It was resolved within a week on each occasion, and uh, we carried on from there. But you can imagine that was... Uh, those two incidents were actually quite stressful, but, you know, you worked through them and it made you a better person afterwards, as it were, a stronger person. Yeah, it's, it's that resilience, isn't it? And knowing that, you know, you've just got to take it each day, probably at a time and it all yeah, comes. Yeah. Literally shake yourself down and get on with it. Quite frankly, people can <laughs> feel sorry for you for a day, but they, everyone else has got their own worries and problems. So. Yes, you get the sympathy for the day, but uh, in a week's time or two weeks' time, they've got other things to think about. So you actually have to show a bit of resilience and providing you've got support of family, very close friends, and as it were, an immediate boss or a mentor, you get on with life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. You you've obviously have like a lot of stories from um, from your career so far. So with that in mind, what do you think is the one thing about your journey that you think most people would be surprised to learn? Um, I don't know whether most people know. I don't know what, whether people know my sort of history. But one is sort of um, you know I, I I actually went into hospitality because I was keen on food, even though it wasn't my parents' choice, and I sort of went to conventional I went to I was fortunate enough to go to boarding school and whatever and my parents had planned for me to be a vet to sort of assist on in the family concern my eldest brother being was planned to be a farmer ended up being a farmer my next brother was you know trained to be an estate agent to sort of manage the estate that went to plan and I was meant to be a vet to, to sort of to help with the animals so that was dad's master plan and uh, I suppose in my final year at university, you start thinking, what do I really want to do? And uh, I really thought, enjoyed food. And my father said to me, and this was, what, 1965, he says, you know, I'm happy that you, if you're interested in food, but I really want you to get a degree because he had had a degree. And so if you can find a university that does a degree course related to food, I will support you. And fortunately, 1966 was the first year Battersea stroke Surrey University decided to start a degree course in hotel management. So I was actually the very first year of that degree course and ended up you know, leaving university and you know, joining the industry is probably the first person with a degree in hotel management in our sector. So, um, you know, that was one bit. So it was the food side and the farming background. And I suppose also the unknown bit is um, I actually had a very musical background. Um, at school, I was a chorister singing in, you know, cathedrals and 
special places, you know, from school and playing the violin. And I've always had that interest in music and opera all my life. And I suspect that's not known to many people. <laughs> I didn't know that, no. But uh, I'm sure somebody out there probably does about you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so what would you say some of the personal sacrifices you've had to make to achieve your personal goals? And do you have any regrets? Uh, not really. I mean, well, yes and no, of course, one has regrets. The, the, the real thing is, if I think back, I've always, as it were, thought of what I term job and career opportunities first in that straight after university, what, you know, sort of first job was Hawker Sidley at Hatfield. So li living in you know, sort of a shared accommodation for a, a year, 18 months there with four other people, because that's all you could afford. Then moving to the Midlands to work with Chrysler, then going from Chrysler to Ford Motor Company for a year, then to Northern Ireland for two to three years, then to the Middle East, Riyadh, Bahrain, um, Lebanon, then back from the Middle East to Gardner Merchant in Croydon, then Rygate and then Central London, then the B then DCMS in London and BHA. But what I'm saying is, you've actually moved at the drop of a hat when you had to to pursue your career. It wasn't, oh, I can't go here or I can't go there. You never even thought about it. You know, you went where the opportunity was, and you know that you know can play on your social life and your private life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that mentality's changed slightly? Because I feel as though um, potentially some people today might be more, this is where I want to be. I don't want to be away from my family. Oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm sure it has. I mean, even to the extent when I was doing the BHA job, which I enjoyed enormously, because you were traveling to every region of the country, what um, we had eight regions which i went to three times a year so that's sort of 24 regional meetings from scotland to the northwest to the northeast to the southwest it meant that i, I decided there the best way was to travel up from brighton on a monday morning and stay in hotel monday tuesday wednesday thursday and then go home on friday and what I found was that was actually best for your home life because at least when you got home on a Friday, you were there for the weekend. But during the week, you devoted your entire time to the job, going to private functions, which was always one or twice a week, being around the, the country, traveling. So you, you, you put the job first, but you worked out that balance that worked best for you, your private life and the job. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure people would make the same sacrifice today in that amount of traveling and commitment to the job and being away from home. But no, you can I only do that with a secure relationship. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. you're right. I think there's a shift, definitely. <clears throat> On that same note of like difference in mindset between generations, how would you approach mentoring the next generation of leaders and what um, key qualities do you believe are essential for their success? Well, I, I think you, you actually have to talk to people about what do they actually want to achieve in life? You know, people, you know, uh, that, and that is always the most important thing. What is it you actually want to do, want to achieve? And, you know, not everyone is going to be a leader or even a senior leader. Some people just want to be able to go and, you know, do a, a normal job and do it to the best of their ability. And they're quite happy with that. But you actually have to find out and ask people what it is you want to achieve. You know, what is important to you? And then you can actually start talking about, well, how do you do that? And I think that is the important question. First of all, what do you want to achieve? How do you want to do that? And actually ask questions of yourself. What are you good at? What are you not good at? Because you don't want people to have unrealistic um, ambitions, which you know they're never going to achieve and i do feel sometimes people do have unrealistic ambitions and it takes them a long long time of being knocked back and damaged almost because they're following unrealistic ambitions so that is a, a key issue is having honest talks with people about 
what they want to achieve, how they get there, and what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses. I think that always comes into then about having that um, self-awareness and understanding where you need to improve, what's your greatest assets. And probably, like you say, it's having realistic goals. I think I'm, I'm not. And, actually... and that often in your 20s, I think that's a di that, that's quite difficult. It may be you, you need to get to your mid 30s before you can start doing that properly. And also, you know, it's not just about you doing that for yourself having one or two people who are close to you that you respect, who are actually prepared to sit you down and, as it were, see yourself as others see you, because that's quite important as well. Yeah. Before we go on to the next set of questions, I actually just want to ask you if there was a particular job or period in your career you feel like you experienced the most personal growth, and why do you think it is? I suspect in some ways it was my sort of 18 months plus when I was the advisor at DCMS. Um, it was a relatively short period when you think of sort of the length of your career, but it, 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 it was transformational to me in some ways in that I had a, had a long career at Gardner Merchant as sort of, um, I'd say, shadowing Gary Hawkes in many regards, but I learned an awful lot from Gary and I have the highest regard for him. But when I went to be the advisor at DCMS, it was tourism advisor. And I remember on the interview before I got the job, um, Chris Smith said to me, um, who was the, the culture secretary then, um, he said, we're looking for a tourism advisor. And I said to him, well, I think I'm well versed in hospitality, but I don't know a lot about tourism. And his response to me was, well, no one else knows anything about tourism, so you'll get on quite well. <laughs> so that was the opening remark. But I went there, but within, a, within three months of being at DCMS, we had developed the first ever tourism policy for a government. And we went and it was developed with half a dozen people, seniors of the industry, people like Charles Allen, etc. We developed this policy and then the government decided that, yes, it was a great policy. It was all signed off and it had to be launched. And Chris Smith said, right, invite all the seniors of industry to London and we'll do a launch, which I will do and you can assist. And he said, once we've done that initial launch, you then take it to every region of the country and you can act as DC, you can act as the Secretary of State and you do the launch everywhere. So, you know, that was a pretty fast growing up, as it were, time when, you know, the first time you were terrified to actually stand up in front of 300 people and launch a government policy and then to go around the country on your own with um, officials from DCMS to do it to all the leaders of all the tourism bodies around the country eight times. You know, that took quite a bit of doing, shall we say. And you also had to learn about how government worked, how the job worked, i.e. Uh, industry expected you to be their voice in terms of talking to government about what their issues were. And government, in turn, expected you to relate back down to industry what their objectives were. So you were doing that constant job. So it was 18 months of what I term very quick learning and having to grow in confidence uh, to be able to present yourself and articulate the concerns of all sides, which you know was was new to me, but I think fortunately my training at Gardner Merchant had been a great training for that. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I think often people quite like um, growing at a kind of steady space or being nurtured, whereas that sounds quite in the deep end. Whereas you just kind of have to just stay afloat and just figure it out and be confident and maybe well, that. Well, absolutely, and just hope that the training you've had to date and your background and upbringing will see you through. And uh, fortunately, I think when I think back, you know, I had great training at Gardner Merchant and by Gardner Merchant and Trust House Forty to the extent that for what, 15 years I was looking after PR and corporate affairs. And when I started that, they sent me off to 
uh, Young and Rubicon, Burst and Marstella to have what I term a week's proper training. They sent me off to the BBC in how to handle media, etc., etc. So I had all that sort of training in my locker to actually help you cope with public speaking, articulation, communication with the media, the press, radio, television. And then, you know, you did have a, what I term a fairly deep understanding of issues that mattered, certainly in hospitality, to which was, you know, actually, you know, hospitality is 80% of what I term the tourism mix. So, um, when I think back, I had all the tools. It was a matter of bringing it all together and having the confidence to go with it. So um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. I just want to um, ask you a little bit about your own perspectives on the current business landscape, because I feel like you'll have a quite a good outside in uh, view on things. Um, do you think that leaders are open to change today and are adapting to a new business environments? Um, I think they are, but whether it's by choice or by necessity, I, I'm never quite sure. But, you know, the reality is that COVID shook up all hospitality businesses and probably, you know, contract catering probably suffered for two years during COVID more than what I term restaurants and hotels. But it has bounced back, but it's bounced back differently because, you know, a lot of people are working from home the requirement, the offering is different. So, you know, COVID has forced change. And whilst I think some leaders are a little slow to adapt, I think they have adapted now because the market forces you to adapt. If you don't adapt in this day and age, you don't survive because, you know, with costs rising, as they have done over the last three or four years, revenues been all over the place, if you haven't adapted, you will not have survived. So, yes, there has been great change, but I think it's been forced on people. Now I'm hoping over the next three, four, five years, we'll continue to see innovation and change, but it'll be done in a more positive way because, you know, we've, we've essentially recovered turnover post-COVID. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, with with that in mind, why do you think a gap has emerged between leadership teams and emerging generations with like with all the change that's been happening recently? Good question, and I don't have an answer. I can speculate <laughs> because it's not just in our industry. I think one of the most alarming statistics I see are the ones put out by ONS to show that over nine million people are no longer what they term economically active. Yeah, uh, that's 9 million on what a workforce of 30 million. And they're also saying that over 800,000 young people, 18 to 21 year olds, are not even seeking work. Now, you know, that is frightening. And I think, you know, COVID has a lot to do with changing attitudes to work. But as a as a nation, and I don't think it's just the UK, I think, you know, Western Europe has similar problems, you know, how we then get people back to wanting to take part in society and contribute to society by, you know, being in work, because that's what being in work is about. Being in work is, is you know, not just about earning money for yourself, but it's being able to make contributions to the state which fund health, education, roads, transport, infrastructure, and all the things we want to do. And if we have a growing generation of people who don't want to contribute to that, that is a major challenge we have to face up to for the future. And I think everyone should be addressing their minds to that, business leaders everywhere, not just politicians. How do we start to get people back into work so that they want to contribute to the society in which they're they're living in and they are actually enjoying the benefits definitely it's all about creating something in the end and i think it's just about how do we get people to tap into that creative mindset kind of like in their work and everyday lives absolutely well well, well it's, it's, it's akin to wanting the benefits of free speech in the society we have here but not wanting to, as it were, support how you get free speech. And, you know, if you look back to, say, my parents' generation, they had to go to war to, as it were, fight for 
freedom and democracy and free speech. And then we, we now take in this country, we take that for granted. What we've got to look at with this generation is, you know, all the benefits we have of state education, the NHS, all the infrastructures, et cetera, et cetera. That has to be paid for primarily by the public purse. And that's, that's contributed from people in work. So that's why we've got to get people to understand the connection between people in work, the contribution they make, and the benefits they get from, from, the, from the state because of that. And on the other side of the coin, do you think that business has lost the balance between profit and purpose? I think if this, go, this goes in what I term phases, for want of a better word. You know, when things are desperate, you know, COVID, post-COVID, as it were, all people can focus on is the bottom line and survival, because that's the way the capitalist system works, as it were. When you get beyond the survival stage, and, and we're now past that, and things are running much better, you've actually got to take a, a wider and a longer perspective in terms of how do I invest in people and my business for the long term? And I don't just mean survival this year. I mean the long term. And one thing that opened my eyes was when I retired from the BHA and did 10 years of consultancy, a lot of that was with private companies, proprietary owned businesses. And one could see the difference there that family owned businesses were investing as it were, for the next generation. The mantra was, how can I ensure that this business is in better shape for my sons, my daughters, the next generation? Whereas the corporate lifestyle was almost, how can I ensure that profits are okay this year so I can earn my bonus? So the corporate sector had a life, life scale of sort of one year, as opposed to the private sector, family businesses were looking at a 15, 20 year cycle. And that's quite a difference. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all we have time for today. But thank you so much, Bob, for joining us and for being open to hard-hitting questions. Insights like yours are invaluable as they provide emerging generations with knowledge and perspectives that aren't always shared. And while there are so many books covering the te technical aspects of business, it's the deeper, more personal insights that truly resonate and inspire. So that explains why we're here today, as it is exactly that we aim to explore and share in this new podcast. Thank you to all our online listeners for coming back and listening to episode two. We hope to see you for episode three.